Hello, this is Aaron Maller from Parallax, and this video is going to just be a quick introduction into the concepts and the general layout of the code compliance or life safety sheets uh, and views that are inside the Parallax version of the Revit template. Keep in mind they may look a bit different graphically than the ones that are in uh, your client retrofitted version of the template, but more than anything we just want to go through the functionality and how all of the pieces work together, and then the actual training videos will go in depth into how to use all of these different pieces. So to start, um, when we first look at the code compliance plan, um, it is an area plan, and you'll notice that in our version of the template, we have the areas colored by occupancy type. Uh, that's not required, it's just something we like to do so that graphically we can check and see <clears throat> which areas are uh, coded with which occupancy type. Now, our life safety or code compliance plan has a number of schedules that run across the top of the sheet. Uh, sometimes they'll get moved to the side depending on the building plan. We have one schedule that is listing out the lengths of all of the travel distance paths per level that are shown on each plan. We have one table that is calculating uh, the total square footage, the area per occupant, and the number of people on this level of the building. We have uh, horizontal exit requirements for this level of the building as well, based on the same square footage. And then we also have um, horizontal exiting specifically at the stairs um, so that you can compare it against the levels above. There is also a list of particular doors uh, that are serving as exit doors on this level, as well as how many occupants they are all serving. Uh, and then finally, there is also just a simple note by number generic annotation block in case somebody wants to sprinkle um, notes that are just numbered around the plan. As we get into the plan itself, uh, in our version of the template, uh, there are area tags that are being shown. Uh, this is more just as a demonstration for clients so they can see what's possible. So of course, because this is an area plan, we're reading areas uh, instead of the rooms. And of course, those areas can have names and they do have square footages. Uh, the areas themselves, um, based on the occupancy uh, classification they're given, are reporting the number of occupants in each area, but it's not a requirement that you show that in the tag. So in this particular case, we're showing name, area, and occupancy count, but you can also just show name and area. You can also just show name, um, and if you want to, you can show things other than the name, such as, oh, I guess that has uh, occupancy type and occupants and the name. So it's not a requirement that you show that in the tag because the occupants are listed in the schedule at the top, um, but some AHJs have asked for it to be inside the tags, so we've built a way to do that. In addition, things like fire extinguishers and other equipment that is relevant is just getting a standard tag in the plan um, using an item type tag. And then we also have particular life safety or code compliance door tags. These are reading automatically the number of occupants served, and then the number of occupants required to be served gets filled in manually after completing your code review and looking at how many exits there are on the plan. There is also a rating parameter for any um, uh, smoke compartment exit doors that you may want to show as rated as well, and that's the big question mark because this door is not rated. And then of course we list the door number in the tag below. Keep in mind, all of the tags, shapes, graphics, and sizes can change. All of the distances that we want to tag with a length are done uh, using modeled railings. Um, several years ago, Revit did create a specific path of travel tool, but it still has some shortcomings graphically compared to using the railing methodology. So what we've done is there are certain railing types that are shown here. And again, this is at every firm's discretion. It's not required that they all be used. Um, essentially, though, we have uh, travel distances, egress paths, that we prefix with a capital letter E when we tag them with their length, and that is what generates the egress path schedule. And then we use uh, the exact same tag on a different type of railing uh, that we call common path of travel, and then we prefix those with a C, which is more just to denote what this path is showing, but of course the Cs do not go into the travel distance schedule. Similarly, we also use uh, 
another railing type called distances between fire extinguishers as another taggable length that we don't put in a schedule just in case somebody wants to show the code reviewer what the distance is as you walk through the corridors to the fire extinguishers uh, in the building. We see a lot of firms try to document this using radii from the fire extinguisher cabinets, but you can't walk through walls in the building, so we find that to be a little disingenuous, and we prefer to show it actually walking down the corridor. There is also a tag type for stair runs, uh, and the stairs have to be named a particular way in order for this to work, but this basically depicts what is the stair width, uh, the uh, width per occupant, and the number of occupants served. Um, so that we can count uh, the egress from the floors above. As you'll see in the training videos, not all of this information, of course, needs to be present on the plans. They can be cleaned up a lot by minimizing some of the tags that are showing. Um, and also, a lot of these things are scheduled. So as an example, you could simply show uh, a tag that lists the tag number or the travel distance number, and then you could go to the schedule to get the length. One thing that's important to know is there are a number of other what we call worker schedules that are in the template, and that is where the occupancy calculations are coming up because Revit does have um, one situation that happens where we can automate the calculations of the occupants in each area, but the way Revit calculations work, that smart calculation cannot go into this tag. So to show you what I mean by that, we have a system in place where if we were to take this wall and we were to move this wall to this mullion, you would now see that in the occupancy count schedule, two of these rows have turned red. That's because if you go to what we call the working occupancy schedule, there is a column that is intelligently calculating, and there is a column that can go inside the tag in the plan. And unfortunately, there is no way to automatically tie these two together without using an application or something like Dynamo. So what we're doing instead is the schedules do color themselves bright red the moment they know that something is wrong, and that basically is telling our user base that they have to go in here and compare this column to this column, and if they correct those numbers based on the changes that we've just seen in the model, now everything will be back up to uh, being correct in the schedule and down in this plan. All of these schedules fill themselves in based on a series of instructions that I'll send you in the training videos. Uh, it has to do with stepping through a series of schedules that ask you questions, uh, such as um, assigning the occupant load factors to the building or to each area. And when you assign those, it then generates the area per occupant and the occupants calculated on the fly. So these are not things that are getting automatically typed in. They're things that are filling themselves in based on uh, selections that you make. From there, you'll basically go into another schedule called plumbing requirements, and you'll similarly fill in um, a plumbing occupancy key as well. And when you do that, it will also start to calculate uh, the number of um, plumbing fixtures that need to be present in the building uh, on another code sheet. So with that, um, a lot of the graphics can be changed and customized in terms of the tag shapes uh, and in terms of what the symbols look like. But in general, what we're trying to do is make sure automatically measured distances and or occupants and counts are all happening in live schedules. That way the data is updating itself and we are showing whatever the authorities having jurisdiction require. Uh, we're just showing it in tag form and trying to make the drawings look as clean as possible. Um, note that there are all kinds of customizations we can do to the view templates in terms of is furniture showing, is equipment showing, how big are these tags or how wide are these tags. We don't need to show square footages. If we do show them, we can round them to you know the square foot if you prefer. Um, all of these things are customizable. Um, and again, the tags don't have to show as much information as they are here. Um, this is simply how we do it to show off the possibilities of everything that's in uh, the life safety template. So I'll also send over the training videos. They are a little longer to watch just in case you want to see how they work when people go to step through these processes. Um, it is a fair amount of work to learn where you go and change the settings to do the automated occupancy and plumbing calculations, but 
those calculations need to happen somewhere anyway. Uh, so we figure folks are either learning how to do it here, and then at least the model is working for them if the square footages change and the user isn't aware that the calculations have changed, at least we can warn them about that. Um, versus they're doing the calculations somewhere else like Excel, and then they're putting it in a text box anyway. Uh, so let me know what you think. I'll send over the PDF and the training videos for this particular sheet as well, uh, just so you can see how it all works.